should expect to see certain principles of biblical understanding that are recognized in our time period that are also used to establish the message of the hour and we pointed out that one of those rules we believe applies here in the reform movement of the 144,000 is a triple application of prophecy and we're saying this is the reform movement of the Millerites and this is the reform movement of the 144,000 so I put a lot of extra stuff on last presentation but to keep it simple last presentation was that the seven trumpets the last three are woes and that the pioneers if you maintain the foundational understanding identified that the trumpets identify the providential forces that bring down Rome and that the last three trumpets are three woes which is a triple application of prophecy and that the characteristics at a simple level of the first woe is that it is Islam attacking the armies of Rome and they strike suddenly and unexpectedly the characteristics of the second woe are once again Islam attacking the armies of Rome suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives and we applied that to say that when the third woe arrives in history we should expect to see Islam striking the armies of Rome which we identify prophetically as the United States at the end of the world suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives and we're not denying or move afraid of dealing with, with the questions that are raised about was it Islam that really was behind September 11th or was it the globalist because as we move forward in our study here today it is not it's not who accomplished 9-11 that is the prophetic marker of September 11th and Islam what is the marker of Islam that we are to see is when Islam is restrained okay so it's about the restraining of Islam and if you believe that it was George Bush and the CIA that that accomplished September 11th or if you believe that it was Islam or if you believe it was a combination of those two that isn't the issue the issue is are you not all aware that immediately after September 11th 2001 that George Bush went to the entire world and said we're now going to put a restraint on Islam that's the issue is that Islam was restrained at that point you will see why that is the prophetic marker as we proceed but in the center of page 38 it says now comes the word that I've declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave this I have never said I have said as I looked at the great buildings going up there story after story what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth then the words of Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 will be fulfilled and we spent time this morning identifying that verse 4 of Revelation 18 is the Sunday law in the United States and therefore verses 1 through 3 is illustrating a prophetic history that comes before the Sunday law in the United States whatever it may be and in, in verse 1 of Revelation 18 a mighty angel comes down and the earth is lightened with its glory and so when it says then the words of Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 will be fulfilled the whole of the 18th chapter of Revelation is a warning of what is coming on the earth but I have no light in regard to what is coming on New York only that I know that one day the great buildings there will be thrown down by the turning and the overturning of God's power from the light given me I know that destruction is in the world one word from the Lord one touch of his mighty power and these massive structures will fall scenes will take place the fearfulness of which we cannot now imagine if you turn to Revelation chapter 9 in a seven-day Adventist we understand that a name prophetically represents what character in Revelation 9 we see the first and second woe as Islam in verse 11 which is in the history of the first woe which is the history from the time period of Muhammad until the year 1449 
Okay, that's, that's roughly 700 and some years. The history that is covered by the first woe covers over 700 years, all right, or, or right around 700 years. And verse, uh, verse 11 of chapter 9 is in the history of the first woe. So read with me, if you will, verse 11 of chapter 9. And it says, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. And what's a name represent? Character. So whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. So... In both, we have the, the name or the character of this king that's over Islam. We know this isn't a human being because there wasn't any human being in that history that lived for 700 years, right? So this is, this is representing, you know, the, the, the easy one is it's the angel of the bottomless pit. Okay, that's Satan. There's, there's your first choice. I'm not going to argue that. But um, just like Sister White comments on Revelation 12, she says, the dragon of Revelation 12 is Satan, but in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome, okay? And there's places where Sister White tells, uh, teaches plainly that Satan is the Antichrist. Did you know that? And other places where she says the Pope is the Antichrist. So sometimes he, Satan, not, Satan can be interchangeable with certain entities, and it's prophetically acceptable, so I'd say, you know, it's prophetically acceptable here in verse 11 to also say that the king that's over Islam is the Quran or Muhammad, the this, this so-called, um, what do you call that? He's not a biography. He's not the author. You know, Muhammad didn't write. It was his scribes that wrote it. What is it if I would tell it and you would write it? What's that make me? Okay, so anyway, Muhammad or the Quran is the king uh, over Islam and the character of the guiding influence over Islam, both in the Hebrew and the Greek tongue, is Abaddon and Apollyon, which means destroyer, death, destruction. If you're not familiar with, with what those names mean, they mean death, destruction, destroyer. Um, t in your notes, if you turn forward to page 45... <coughs> uh, under the four winds restrained Sister White says angels are holding the four winds and we know that the four winds that she's discussing here are the four winds of Revelation 7 verse 1 through 3 and the four winds that are restrained in Revelation 7 verse 1 through 3 are the winds that are restrained in the time period when the 144,000 are to be sealed okay that's common correct Adventist understanding. Angels are holding the four winds represented as an angry horse. Now brothers and sisters, Sister White puts inspired endorsement on both these charts. And when the pioneers dealt with Revelation 9 and it came time for them to graphically, artistically, symbolically represent Islam of the fifth and sixth trumpet, the symbols they chose to represent Islam is this horse and this horse and this horse and this horse and as we already pointed out the very first mention of the deep prophetic DNA of Islam is in Genesis 16 12 where the prophecy of Islam says that he will be a wild man and that word wild is the wild Arabian horse the angry horse of Bible prophecy is Islam. At least it would be in the, the understanding of Sister White. She was a Millerite. That's how the Millerites understood how you represent Islam. There's the proof. So when Sister White says angels are holding the four winds represented as an angry, angry horse seeking to break loose because they're restrained, all right, and rush over the face of the whole earth bearing destruction and death in its path. What's the character of Islam? Apollyon, Abaddon. Death, destruction. Do you see it? She's not, only, she's not only saying that the four winds that are restrained are represented by the angry horse. She says what they represent is death and destruction. So the, the character of Islam is found in Revelation 9 is found where in Revelation 9? 
verse 11. And it's represented as an angry horse. So when you go back to page 38, in the center of that quote we just read from Review and Herald, July 5th, 1906, she says, but I have no light in regard, in particular, in regard to what is coming on New York, only that I know one day the great buildings there will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. From the light given me, I know that destruction is in the world. Who brings destruction? The angry horse seeking to break loose and bring death and destruction to the whole earth. In Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, a chapter starts. You have it, the entire chapter here. We're just going to touch on this briefly. What we're saying here in this study, brothers and sisters, is that the Millerite history is repeated in our history. <coughs> and that... Daniel 11 verse 40 says and at the time of the end that's 1798 the time of the end for the Millerites the papacy received a deadly wound but by the time you get to end of verse 40 the papacy retaliates against the power that had delivered the ed deadly wound it retaliates against the king of atheism the king of the south is the king of atheism and in Daniel 11 verse 40 the king of atheism in 1798 was atheistic France and it delivered the deadly wound to the papacy in 1798 but as history progresses and it's time for the papacy to retaliate against the king of the atheism in 1989, France is no longer the premier symbol of atheism, the Soviet Union is. And in 1989, the Soviet Union is swept away by an alliance between the United States and the Vatican. And verse 40 is fulfilled, marking the time of the end for the 144,000. Verse 40 is marking the time of the end for both the beginning of Adventism and the end of Adventism. And in chapter 9, or in Testimonies, volume 9, page 11, the first thing that Sister White records for us under the, the title for the coming of the king is the passage from Hebrews that is this parallel passage to Habakkuk 2, verses 1 through 4, that led the Millerites to produce the foundational truce on this chart. Only in Hebrews we see the repetition of this um, scripture placed in the context not of Millerite time period but in the time period when God's people are to be in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Sister White is referencing if you will see it that it is in the time period that we're living in that that testimonies 9 begins and then she starts the first paragraph by saying the last great crisis she says we are living in the time of the end which is 1989 okay and from that point on she says the fast fulfilling signs of the time declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand the days in which we live are solemn and important the spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth Plagues and judgments are already falling upon the despisers of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of societies, the alarms of war are portentous. They forecast approaching events of greatest magnitude. Would you say that's a fair analysis of the history of the world since 1989? It certainly is. And the ne next paragraph says the agencies of evil are combining and their forces and consolidating. In Bible prophecy, there are three primary agencies of evil. You're going to receive the mark of the beast, which is a religious issue. Religion is an agency of evil at the end of the world because the religions are going to come together under the banner of the Sunday law. And they're going to expect everyone to come together with them. Another agency of evil is the financial structure of the world because we're not going to be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. And another agency of evil is the military of the world because they're going to put you to death if you don't do what they say. And what this is saying is in this time period here, in the time of the end, that these agencies of evil, the religious ecumenical movement, 
the globalists, both their financial and the military powers, are going to be consolidating and combining their forces. Since 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the military structures of the world have been coming together. Before they were pretty much polarized into two camps. Since 1989, have you been watching the global system come together as far as finances? They talk about it openly on regular secular news now about the change to a one world currency. Fifteen years ago, the only people that were talking about that were people that were studying prophecy or the people that were following all the different conspiracy theories that fro float through the world today, but now it's open in the common press. And the ecumenical movement is pretty much reached its fruition. It's very clear that the Pope has said there's no way to get to heaven unless you're in the Catholic Church. And he doesn't say that unless he knows when push comes to shove he can make it count. Next quote. <laughs> well, that, that quote. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating their strengthening for the last great crisis. That's the Sunday law crisis, is it not? Great changes are soon to take place in the world and mark this last phrase and the final movements will be rapid ones. When Sister White's talking about this particular history that begins in the time of the end and we're saying it begins in 1989, we will show you why we're saying that in the context of this in a moment. But what she says is when this history begins, the last movements will be rapid ones. When did the Soviet Union collapse? 1989. How many years ago was that? Because that was verse 40. That was verse 40. And verse 41 is a Sunday law in the United States. And the final movements will be a rapid ones. Someone was asking me last night, how long do you think it is until the Sunday law? And I told them this. Sister White says, we can't say less than five years. And we can't say more than ten. So I can't answer your question. <sighs> you figure that one out. That's a... <sighs> The condition, next paragraph, the condition of things in the world show that troublous times are right upon us. Is that so? The daily papers are full of indications of a terrible conflict in the near future. Bold robberies are of frequent occurrences. Do you realize how many bank robberies go on in the United States every day? They don't report them. They keep it quiet. They just deal with them now. Do you realize that? I mean, I'm not making that up. There's bank robberies happening every day in the United States, multiple bank robberies, and they just don't report them anymore. Strikes are common. Thefts and murders are committed on every hand. Men possessed of demons are taking the lives of men, women, and little children. Men had become infatuated with vice, and every species of evil prevails. And the enemy has succeeded in perverting justice and in filling men's heart with the desire for selfish gain. Justice standeth afar off, for truth has fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Of course, this is, this is one of the big problems in the United States today. I was to tell, how many of you know who Glenn Beck is? I mean, I'm not a news junkie, but Glenn Beck is a, a Mormon news guy that has a radio show, and he was on CNN for a while, and now he's on Fox News. And not this previous week, but the week before, we d I happened to see the first thing he said, so I started listening to him on the radio when Kathy and I were driving and, and watching when they could. Do you realize that the week before last, that they printed $1 trillion and sent it out to the banks to try to flood the market? And they said nothing about it. And it was not reported anywhere on CNN. And Glenn Beck was not only saying that he was saying CNN none of the uh, NBC CBS none of them are mentioning this and he says and none of the other people on Fox television network are mentioning it either he says Bill O'Reilly's not touching it and Hannity's not touching it the only one that was saying anything was Glenn Beck and nobody countered him and said he's wrong and what he was saying is is that they've lowered the interest rate to the point that it can't impact the economy anymore and they're so desperate that last week about 10 days ago, they flooded the banks with $1 trillion cash in order to try the last ditch effort to stimulate the economy and they insisted on keeping it quiet because if the American public knew they were trying to do it, it would the, just the idea that they were at the bottom of the barrel would destroy the ability for the stimulus. And that was in the open it was on Fox News on the TV and it was on his radio broadcast. Desperate times. What covered that up 
what covered that up was that the AIG guys were so greedy that they took the bonus, okay? That's the news everyone was consumed with. That's all they wanted to talk about while they're flooding the market with $1 trillion. Justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. We're living in corrupt times where greedy men are doing greedy things. And this is the circumstances that Sister White is placing in this chapter. Then, in the next paragraph, she says, On one occasion, when in New York City I was in the night season called upon to behold buildings rising story after story towards heaven, these buildings were warranted to be fireproof and they were erected to glorify the owners and builders. Higher and still higher these buildings rose and in them the most costly material was used. Those to whom these buildings belonged were not asking themselves how, how can we best glorify God. The Lord was not in their thoughts, I thought. Oh, that those who are thus investing their means could see the course as God sees it. They are piling up magnificent buildings. But how foolish in the sight of the ruler of the universe is their planning and devising. They are not studying with all the powers of heart and mind how they may glorify God. They have lost sight of this, the first duty of man. As these lofty buildings went up, the owners rejoiced with ambitious pride that they had money to use in gratifying self and provoking the envying of their neighbors. Much of that money they that they thus had they have thus invested had been obtained through exaction through grinding down all the, the the poor they forgot that in heaven an account of bu every business transaction is kept every unjust deal every fraudulent act is there recorded the time is coming when in the, their fraud and insolent men will reach to a point that the Lord will not permit them to pass and they will learn that there is a limit to the forbearance of Jehovah the scene that next passed before me and I'm saying that when Sister White says we're now living in the time of the end, that this is the end of the world. And she's saying 1989 has arrived. And she begins to describe the history that follows 1989. And then in this paragraph here, after discussing the magnificent buildings in New York City in a passage that begins in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, she says this. The scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said, They are perfectly safe. But these buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines because the buildings came down on top of the fire engines. <laughs> I am stru instructed that when the Lord times come should no change have taken place in our hearts in the hearts of proud ambitious human beings men will find that the hand that had been strong to save will be strong to destroy next paragraph after 9-11 after 9-11 it says there are not many even John McCain or Obama or George Bush, there are not many, even among educators and statesmen, who comprehend the causes that underlie the present state of society. Those who hold the reins of government are not able to solve the problem of moral corruption, poverty, pauperism, and increasing crime. They are struggling in vain to place business operations on a more secure basis. If men would give more heed to the teaching of God's word, they would find a solution of the problem that perplex them. Do you see the United States struggling in vain to place business operations on a more secure basis? The scriptures describe the condition of the world just before Christ's second coming. Of the men who by robbery and exhortion are amassing great riches, it is written, you have reaped up treasures together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborer who's reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived in pleasure on earth. You've been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. From James chapter 5, there is a warning connected in this passage, if you read the entire passage, about their riches and gold being turned to rust, identifying an economic collapse. 
And then it raises the question. But who reads the warnings given by the fast fulfilling signs of the times? Who reads these warnings brothers and sisters? The children of the light. The children of the day. Not the children of darkness and the children of, of night. Who understands these signs? Well according to these histories the wise. The wise understand this increase of knowledge. In other words, these things are going to be understood by the children of the day, the children of light, in Adventism, the wise, virgins. But there's, there's some in Adventism, like the days of Noah, they don't think anything about the animals getting on the ark. That don't mean anything, does it? I've never seen the animals get on the ark before. That can't mean anything. The scriptures describe the... But who reads the warnings given by the fast fulfilling signs of the times? What impression is made upon worldlings? What change is seen in their attitude? No more, no more was seen in the attitude of the inhabitants of the Noatian world. Absorbed in worldly business and pleasure, the antediluvians knew not until the flood came and took them all away. They had seven heaven sent warnings, but they refused to listen. And today the world, utterly regardless of the warning voice of God, is hurrying on to eternal ruin. And then notice what she says. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Is it? The prophecy of Revelation 13 has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. The prophecy of First Peter. The prophecy of Daniel chapter 11 and brothers and sisters the last six verses of Daniel 11 are the events that connected the close of probation that sister white says multitudes don't understand but that have been clearly presented we've read that here already but the understanding of the last six verses of Daniel 11 it came into it, it was established in 1995 it was, it was placed into a magazine that's been translated into so many languages around the world I don't even know how to count them any longer. Since 1995 the understanding of the last six verses has been out there in Adventism all around the world but multitudes in Adventism don't understand those last six verses but of those multitudes that don't understand those last six verses there are many many of those that are understood to be experts in biblical things that will tell you point blank I don't understand what the last six verses of Daniel 11 represent but I know that what those guys are teaching from this time period of on, on it is incorrect that's the only thing they know about what we're teaching about Daniel 11 40 to 45 is that it's incorrect but at the same time they will tell you but I don't know what those verses are there's something that that isn't correct about that when Sister White says the events connected with the close of probation have been clearly revealed. At this time, Sister White's saying, at this time, in the time of the end, in the history that we've all agreed is being described here in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, is happening now in this history. She says, the prophecy of the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. Brothers and sisters, Sister White understood that Daniel 11 verses 1 30 through 39 was fulfilled before her time period on earth. She knew that Daniel 11:40 started in 1798 because Daniel 11:40 says, and at the time of the end, and she said in great controversy, the time of the end is 1798. So when she's speaking about the final fulfillment of Daniel 11, she's talking about Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And she places that as the prophecy that is the point of reference for the time of the end and the events that take place that parallel the warning message that Noah gave in his day and age because the reform movement of Noah lines up perfectly with the reform movement of Elijah and Moses and Cyrus and John the Baptist and William Miller and today Daniel 11 40 to 45 is that warning message and when sister White's talking about the time of the end in testimonies volume 9 page 11 it's Daniel 11 that she references 
and nowhere else. Turn with me to page 43 of your notes. In, in Revelation chapter 1, you see the introduction to the book of Revelation. And in chapter 1, Christ identifies one characteristic of himself more than any other. And we read a quote here last night that says, um, when, cr when something is repeated in the word of God, it means that we're to put an emphasis on it. And the one truth that's repeated about Christ in Revelation chapter 1 more than any other is that he is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and ending. And he illustrates that truth in a variety of ways. And one of those ways is found in Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8. It's on the top of your notes, or you can turn to it in your Bible. It says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God, and who is I shall call, and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming, and shall come. Let them show unto them, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have I not told thee from that time, and declared it? Ye are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. His witnesses are going to understand that he portrays the end of the world from the beginning of the world because he's the first and the last and they're going to understand that as he portrays the end of the world from the beginning of the world one of the prophetic tools that the Lord uses to do that is that he appointed the ancient people the end of the world is illustrated in the book of Revelation and in the book of Revelation you have Israel the 144,000 modern Israel and they've been illustrated by who? ancient Israel in Revelation chapter 11 you have modern Egypt who illustrates Egypt of Revelation 11 verse 8? Ancient Egypt. In Revelation 17, you have modern Babylon. Who illustrates modern Babylon? Ancient Babylon. And in Revelation 9, if you maintain the foundational understanding, you have Islam at the end of the world. And where is Islam at the end of the world illustrated? In the beginning. You'll notice Genesis 49 verses 1 and 28 that um, Jacob called his 12 sons together to pronounce a blessing upon them. And in the blessing that he pronounced on his sons, he was pronouncing a prophecy about the role that his sons would play at the end of time. Um, Sister White plainly says so. You, you have the quote from Patriarchs and Prophets uh, that identifies that. And have you ever noticed that one of the symbols of God's kingdom is the number 12? There were 12 sons of Jacob, 12 disciples. Tw how many gates into the city? 12. 12 is a number. Upon the testimony of two or three things is established, one of the symbols of God's kingdom is 12. Who was is, who is Abraham's firstborn? Ishmael. Okay. He was, he's not the inheritor of the covenant promise, but he's the firstborn. And how many sons did Ishmael have? Twelve. Somehow, some way, Bible prophecy is clear. That I don't know. Bible prophecy is clear. <laughs> You've got to save your questions until we're done, right? <laughs> Bible prophecy is clear <coughs> that there is some prophetic connection of Islam, Ishmael and his descendants with God's kingdom. It would have been just as easy. God's control of everything. He could have had 11 princes for his sons or 13, but he had 12. All right. There is a connection and there's always been a connection. When the, Lord, when the Lord commanded Israel to do the sanctuary service, they were commanded to use certain spices in the sanctuary service. And those spices are only grown in the part of Saudi Arabia that was always controlled by the descendants of Ishmael. And in order to operate the sanctuary service, Israel was always required to have a relationship with Ishmael's descendants or they couldn't have accessed the incense necessary for them to operate the sanctuary. There was purposeful connections between Islam or Ishmael's descendants and God's people throughout biblical history. The prophecy of Ishmael that we've looked at previously, I am saying parallels the prophecies of the 12 sons of Jacob. So it's prophecies for Ishmael at that time, but it's also prefiguring their role at the end of the world. And you can see that on your, in the center of page 43. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man. And every man's hand will be against him. 
and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And of course we've already pointed out that this word wild is the wild Arabian ass. And while some of you were descending the cliff and then coming back up the cliff, I've been down that road before here, um, I stayed here. There was a brother that asked a question and I'll, I'm going to jump I answered his question, but I'm going to use that as a point to jump off. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation 13, verse 2. Now, this is outside the scope of our notes, so there's a couple Spirit of Prophecy quotes that I'm going to just share with you, but I don't have them front and center for you. But Sister White comments on Daniel on Revelation 12, and she says, The dragon in Revelation 12 rep represents Satan, but in a secondary sense it represents pagan Rome. You with me? That's in the great controversy. The dragon in Revelation 12 is not only Satan, but it's, it's also pagan Rome. It's Satan, but the work the, of opposition to Christ and persecution that Satan accomplished in Revelation 12 was carried out through his earthly representative, which was pagan Rome at that time. But Revelation 12 and 13, there's not a break, and this is a new thought. Revelation 13 is a continuation of the thought. And in Revelation 13, 2, it says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Sister White plainly says, if you don't understand this, this beast is the papacy. Okay, we're not discussing that. But, and the beast which I saw was like unto the leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon... And this is just a continuation of chapter 12. Therefore the dragon here is Satan. But in a secondary sense it is pagan Rome. Okay. The dragon gave the papacy, the beast, three things. The dragon removed three things for the papacy. The three horns, the Heroli, the Ostrogoth, and the Vandals. But it gave three things to the papacy. Remove three, gave three. And the three things that it gave was its military power. And there's several verses to demonstrate this. It gave its seat. And it gave its great authority. Pagan Rome, the dragon, gave three things to the papacy as the papacy came to take control of the world. In 496, Clovis, king of France, came into a church-state relationship with the papacy and began the, the historical connection between the kings of Europe supplying military and econo economic support for the papacy. This date is kind of a continuum. Whereas pagan Rome gave its seat to the papacy in the year 330 when the emperor of Rome, Constantine, moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople, thus leaving the papal church in the city of Rome to take charge there. It gave its seat of authority to the papacy. In the year 533, the emperor Justinian issued a decree identifying the Pope of Rome as the head of the church and the corrector of heretics. This is the dragon power's work. The dragon, the dragon did these things. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation 17. <coughs> now, I haven't proved what I'm going to say here, but the information is available. I'm going to tell you what it represents and challenge you to test these things. The ten kings, and we've given you one argument earlier today. Remember the three Elijahs? The Jezebel, King Ahab, who was the king of the northern tribe, ten kingdoms, and the prophets of Baal, were prefiguring the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet at the end of the world. The beast at the end of the world is the papacy. That's Jezebel. That's identified in the church of Thyatira. The false prophets of Baal that did the dance of deception in the story of Elijah are prefiguring the false prophet, the United States, that Revelation 13 says deceives the whole world as the prophets of Baal attempted to do. And therefore Ahab, as a civil power, a king, is prefiguring the civil power at the end of the world. And if 
the United States is the false prophet and the papacy is the beast, then Ahab, the civil power, is the dragon. And that's why Testimonies to Ministers, page 38, write this down if you're not familiar with it, it says, Kings, governors, and rulers have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon who goes to make war with the saints. And therefore, what, I, what we're saying is the ten kings in Revelation 17 are the civil power. And the civil power are, is going to give its kingdom to the beast. Notice here, in Revelation 17, um, verse 12, it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Kings, governors, and rulers have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon. A multitude of political figures, the United Nations, okay, the ten horns which thou saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. Is the, is the one world government here yet? They haven't received their kingdom yet. It's, it's, it's not here yet. But receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Who's the beast? Papacy. When the United Nations comes together, it's going to co-rule with the papacy for a short period of time. And you can see this in verse 17. Speaking of the ten kings, it says, For God hath put in their hearts the ten kings, to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. When the United Nations finally takes control of the world in a one world government, the only way they get to do it is they agree to do it by co-ruling with the papacy. Okay? And they represent, the United States, the United Nations represents the civil authority. They represent the dragon power. So I ask you a question. This is the end of the world we're talking about. Has there ever been a t time period in the past when the dragon power gave its civil authority to the papacy? Right there. The year 533. The dragon gave its great authority to the papacy in 533 with the decree of Justinian. And Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning. The first time the dragon power gave its civil authority to the papacy was in 533 and it's prefiguring when the ten kings the dragon power agree to give their kingdom to the papacy at the end of the world so all you have to do is go into the pioneer logic and say what was the history surrounding Justinian giving his civil authority to the papacy and you will find that in this history in this history, brothers and sisters, this was a hard history for Emperor Justinian. It was a hard history because in the year 321, Constantine passed the first Sunday law. And the principle is national apostasy is followed by national ruin. So shortly after 321, in the year 320, 330, Constantine, by moving the capital, in essence divides the Roman Empire into east and west. And then immediately after that, the seven trumpets of Revelation begin to take the former Roman Empire apart piece by piece. And when you get to the fourth trumpet, in the year 476, the Roman Empire in the West is decided, disintegrated into ten kingdoms. That's 476. By four, 533, things have only got worse. The kingdom is disintegrating before Justinian's eyes. But here's my question. What is it that's making his kingdom come apart at the seams? It's a trumpet power. A trumpet power that's bringing war in his kingdom. And in this very time, there's a religious controversy going on. And there's a, there's a lot to say about that religious controversy in the Virgin Mary and this, that, and the other. But nonetheless, it boiled down to, is the primary church in Christendom the church in Constantinople or is it the church in Rome? And Justinian determines, ah, it'll be politically best for me if I identify the Pope of Rome as the head of the churches and the corrector of heretics. So, brothers and sisters, 
the first time the dragon gave its kingdom to the papacy it did so because there was a trumpet power that was bringing the kingdom to its knees and there was a religious crisis so I submit to you that when the dragon power at the end of the world the United Nations agrees to give its kingdom to the beast revelation 17 17 and co-rule with it the reason it will do so is because there is a trumpet power and the trumpet power at the end of the world is the seventh trumpet the third woe islam there is a trumpet power that is bringing the world to its knees and at the same time it's creating a religious crisis and the religious crisis is is there one part of Islam that's acceptable and one part that isn't what part of Islam is acceptable because we have to deal with it do we deal with all of it or do we isolate what we would call radical Islam today and deal with them or do we deal with it all and you know what the world's gonna say we don't trust the United States <laughs> They might put somebody back in charge like George Bush and he's too much of a cowboy. We, we don't trust him. We don't trust the false prophet to, to decide this. And we don't trust the United Nations to decide this because the United Nations doesn't ever get anything done. But there's one moral authority in the world today that everyone trusts. And in the beginning, Justinian said he's the corrector of heretics. And they're going to agree to let him take control of the civil authority in order to be the corrector of heretics and the heads of the churches. Let me tell you one other thing. In the three Elijahs, notice in the three Elijahs that the impure woman, she deceives the civil power. Does she not? After, after Elijah's victory on Carmel, Ahab races back to Jezebel and he says je to Jezebel Jezebel you won't believe it Elijah's God's the real God he called fire down out of heaven I seen it myself and he was expecting Jezebel to say well let's join their church but what did Jezebel say he'll be dead tomorrow Ahab didn't understand the motivations of Jezebel upon the testimony of two things established in the story of John the Baptist Herod says to Salome, the daughter of Herodias, he says, Salome, that was such a wonderful dance. You can name anything you want from me up to half my kingdom. Tell me what you want. Did he think she was going to say, after she counseled with Herodias, what I want is John the Baptist's head in a charger? He was deceived. In both those stories, the civil power, Ahab, and Herod were deceived by the papacy. Therefore, when this plays out, when this history is repeated, when the ten kings agree to give their kingdom to the beast, they're going to be deceived. And the deception's already been illustrated in world history. You know where it's illustrated out really nice to see? When they ca captured Saddam Hussein in his little hole, suddenly there's a controversy going on in the world. And the controversy was this. Do we try Saddam Hussein in Iraq or the United States where they use the death penalty? Or we, do we take him to Holland, to the world court, and try him there where they don't believe in the death penalty? And the globalists, the United Nations, say, no, he needs to be tried in the world court because we don't believe in the death penalty. And the Americans, George Bush and the Iraqis, say, we have no problem with the death penalty for Saddam Hussein. And at that time period, the last pope began to write letters. And you know what he said? We think Saddam Hussein should be tried in the world court because we do not believe in the death penalty the papacy doesn't believe in the death penalty the dragon power the United Nations has already been led to believe that Jezebel's intentions have nothing to do with persecution and as soon as the point is reached in earth's history that this trumpet power the final trumpet 
has brought the world to the place where the United States demands that the only way we can deal with the descendants of Islam whose hands against every man is to implement a one world government and the one world government of the United Nations agrees to the situation based upon the premise that the Pope is going to be the moral authority, the corrector of heretics, then the deception is going to come to pass. And what is the deception? The deception is, is the papacy could care less about Islam. It's going to deal with the Sabbath keepers in its midst. And brothers and sisters, the role of Islam is to bring every man's hand together against it in order to provide the argument to implement a one world government that's going to bring the bloodbath that takes place during the Sunday law testing time and that history is already being acted out. That's the role of Islam that's encoded in Genesis 16:12. Back to, ver to chapter, to page 43. When do we stop? In prophetic... Yeah, we'll finish before six. I promise. I'm just going to go to... Uh, I promise. In, in biblical history... Islam is, all, is both a blessing and curse. An example of it here in, on the bottom of page 43 is Balaam. Balaam's story takes place in Numbers 22. Numbers 22 is just before the children of Israel are going into the promised land. This is clearly clear illustration of the end of the world just before modern Israel goes into the promised land. In that history, Balak hires Balaam to curse Israel. And Balaam comes and he can't curse Israel. All he can do is bless Israel. But Balaam comes from the children of the east. And the children of the east is the symbol of the descendants of Ishmael as they come down through biblical history. The children of the east are the descendants of Ishmael. And they are in Bible prophecy both a blessing and a curse. In biblical times, when Israel was in apostasy, the Lord allowed the children of the east to bring warfare against them and chastise them. But there, there are times in biblical history when the Lord used Islam to preserve God's people. Joseph is carried to safety to Egypt away from his murderous brothers by the Ishmaelite traders. The, the wise men from the east, the children of the east, provide the monetary ability for Joseph and Mary to flee to Egypt to protect Jesus from the persecution. Several illustrations of is the descendants of Ishmael being a blessing in biblical history and a curse. Post-biblical history tells the same story. Once, once the war of Rome and Syria concludes and there's no counterbalance to prevent the rise of Islam in the first woe, Islam very quickly wraps itself around Europe takes northern Africa, goes up in the southern part of Europe, and then goes up around in the northern part of Europe. And in doing that, it places a quarantine. It places the Catholic Church in its own little compartment, preventing Catholicism from spreading around the world. In Islam's heyday, they were very, very aggressive about education. And if you're not familiar with it, there are two streams of manuscripts that Bibles are produced from. One stream is corrupted, and one stream isn't. I know that's a problem for some, but the, str the, the general term for the stream of, trans of, of manuscripts that produces the uncorrupted Bibles is called the received text. And in Islam's heyday, it was in their universities that they copied the received text that is used to produce the King James Bible over and over again and preserved it. It was Islam that preserved the Word of God. And in the Protestant Reformation, if you read the early writings of Martin Luther, he will tell you that the deliverer of the Protestant Reformation was Islam. For every time that the Pope of Rome sent an army to snuff out the reformers, Islam would come down out of the north and the armies that were going to stop the reformation would have to retreat and turn and defend against Islam. And Islam was the deliverer 
of the Protestant Reformation. It's a blessing and it's a curse. Just like we looked at in Revelation 9 verse 4. When they came into history, Abba Becker's command said, When you go forth, you're going to find Sunday-keeping Christians, and you're going to find Sabbath-keeping Christians. You make those Sunday-keeping Christians convert to Islam, or you chop off their head, but you leave the Sabbath-keeping Christians alone. And therefore, at the end of the world, and I, I'm, not, I'm not to prepare to guess how or why, the evidence is, is that while all this is going on, some way, somehow, Islam is going to provide some kind of preservative for those people that are carrying the final warning message to the world. Hurt not those that have the seal of God. They preserve the word of God. They preserved the Protestant Reformation. They contained Catholicism from taking control of the world. Now, you, there's some people when they hear me saying these things, they think hey, you're being you're being so specific about the negative role that Islam plays in Earth's history that you know you're you're contributing to a, a negative attitude about the Muslim people. And I, if I am, I don't mean to be doing that. It, but we shouldn't think that we're Seventh Day Adventists. We've had to deal with that with that mentality for years, haven't we? Haven't we have to, had to deal? all along through our history that when we're identifying the role of the Catholic Church in prophecy that we're not making thrusts to get Catholics. We're just laying out the role of Catholicism in Bible prophecy. This isn't anything to do with individual Catholics. We know the greatest majority of God's people are outside the Adventist Church, do we not? So our brothers and sisters are in the Catholic Church, are they not? So when we're talking about Catholicism prophetically, we've had to struggle with people having misconceptions about what we're doing in that regard. And it's the same thing with Islam. I'm dealing with Islam at the prophetic level. And I haven't the right to have hate or vengeance or anything like that in my heart for any human being. Even even the Muslim, who I believe prophetically is going to provide some kind of protection for God's people to proclaim the final warning message. Why would I? A end of the meeting. <laughs> I, I, have, I have to be consistent. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, I c hey, wait, when, when my wife were baptized into Adventism, we were baptized into Adventism we were the second and third p people to be baptized, baptized into this brand new church. You know who the first person was? This brother right here. So I mean, I, I, I've known this brother <laughs> for hundreds of years, so I, I, I can speak to him in that fashion, all right? But we don't hate Catholicism, do we? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, page 44. No, I understand that principle. I believe the book of Daniel is designed to meet Islamic logic right where it's at. All, all the powers in Earth's history that they think are negative are placed in the book of Daniel in a negative perspective. The United States, the New World Order, Catholicism, and Israel. You explain what prophecy says about those four powers in the book of Daniel, an Islamic mind that understands the implication will say, Amen, that's just what I think. And in, in so doing, you will be illustrating the end of the world. And it gives you the perfect logic to move from Daniel to Revelation and right into the trumpets so they can tell you, uh, or you can tell them about the role they've played in prophetic history. Revelation 11 verse 18 says, it's at the top of page 44, and the nations were angry. And by the way, we already looked at Revelation 11 verse 14. Revelation 11 verse 14 says the second woe is past. Behold the third woe cometh quickly. Verses 15 onward to, to verse 19 of Revelation 11 is describing characteristics connected with the seventh trumpet, the third woe. Okay, if you have your Bible and you're not familiar with that, look at verse 14 of Revelation 11. That's the end of the second woe. And the next verse, verse 15, talks about 
the sounding of the seventh trumpet, which is the third woe. So when we get to verse 18, we are seeing characteristics associated with the seventh trumpet, the third woe, and verse 18 says this, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, to the, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Shortly after 1844, Joseph Bates wrote an article where he said all the components of verse 18 take place at the same time and place. This is the, the fulfillment is simultaneously, these are all the same thing. And immediately thereafter, Sister White was led to pen a passage that is in early writings. It's underneath that quote on page 44 from early writings 36, correcting Joseph Bates among other things. She says, I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct, one following the other. Also, that Michael had not stood up, and that the time of trouble such as never was, has not yet commenced. The nations are now getting angry. But when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary, he will stand up, put up on the garments of vengeance, and then the seven last plagues will be poured out. I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary, and then will come the seven last plagues. Okay? So what I want you to see is that Sister White says the, the, different, care, the different prophetic markers in verse 18, they're separate and distinct, and they go sequentially. They follow one another. And it's easy for us to identify as Adventists our understanding of what the wrath of God is. The wrath of God is the seven last plagues. Okay, the wrath of God is marking when human probation closes. So when verse 18 says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, this is separate and distinct events, and they follow one another, therefore the angering of the nations is something that takes place before probation closes. Follow the logic? Okay. Um, in Luke 21:25. Turn with me to, to Luke. Do I deal with Luke 21? But is it, in, yeah, it's in there. Okay, okay. Well, well, you don't have to turn to Luke 21. I'm going to deal with that. It's one of the presentations. Um, what I'm, what I'm going to suggest to you is that one of the signs that preceded the Millerite history that Christ set forth in Luke 21, he identifies the dark day, the falling of the stars, he identifies 1798, but he also identifies the distress of nations. And the distress of nations that was a sign of Millerite history was the distress of nations that was taking place in this history leading up to 1840. When the four great European powers came together to put a restraint on Islam on August 11th, 1840, one of the things that they were doing is they were bringing to a conclusion the distress of nations. And you need to understand that because it was Islam that was creating this distress of nations. And in Revelation 9 verses 14 and 15 you have a time prophecy of 391 years and 15 days that begins out over here on July 27th, 1449. And it says that there's four angels that are loosed at this point and they go for 391 years and 15 days and they conclude right here. But Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning and the history that allows us to identify the beginning point of this 391 years and 15 days that began in 1449 is when the last emperor of Eastern Rome ha died and the brother of his that was to ascend the throne was afraid to do it without getting permission for the great power from the four great sultans, Islamic sultans that were surrounding him at that time and if you have to ask permission to be king then you're not king so the event that starts this time prophecy is when a king surrenders his national sovereignty to four powers, these four great sultans. That's the beginning of the prophecy, but Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. And the end of the prophecy is when the last of the, the weak ruler of the Ottoman Empire at that time, he surrenders his uh, uh, national sovereignty to the four great European powers. The prophecy begins when a king surrenders his sovereignty to four powers. It ends when a king surrenders his sovereignty to four powers. And in the midst of this time period, the, the premier symbol 
of Islam was the Ottoman Empire. In fact, it's interesting to note that when you go into Islam and you look closely at their writings, they will tell you that there have already been two great jihads. They tell you we're now in the third great jihad. But when you look at the history they identify for the first great jihad, do you know that it's the same history that the Millerites identify for the first woe? And when you look at the history that Islam identifies for the second great jihad, they'll tell you it's the same history that the Millerites identify for the second woe. And Islam will tell you that the third great jihad began on September 11th, 2001. And we're telling you that's when the third woe arrived in history. And what brought the second great jihad to a conclusion here in 1840 is the Ottoman Empire that had been the symbol of, uh, of Islamic strength. Was, its strength was empty and another Islamic country wanted to reestablish the Islamic dynasty and continue to carry on the jihad. And that country was Egypt. And Egypt had money to do it. But it actually went and it took the Turkish navy and captured it and brought it back to Egypt and kept it. And Egypt had the money and the power, but Egypt did not have the foot soldiers. Egypt didn't have the foot soldiers to carry on a war. It had the money. So Egypt struck a deal with a new religious order that had been raised up in Saudi Arabia. And they were prepared to be the foot soldiers of this jihad. This was the distress of nations that is one of the signs that Jesus pointed to of the Millerite history. But this distress of nations was brought to a conclusion when the four great powers of Europe interceded and stopped that attempt by Egypt to reestablish an Islamic dis dynasty and carry on the great jihad. Those Saudi Arabian religious zealots that were willing to be the foot soldiers, do you know what their religion is called now today? It's the same religion. It was called that then and today. It's called Wahhabism. Do you know what Wahhabism is? It's the religion of Ben Laden. The same Ben Laden, the same religion, f religious foot soldiers that were going to carry on the jihad here but were restrained. Identical religion that came back into history here. Do you think that maybe is just a coincidence? I don't. Wahhabi, well, yeah, I, don't, I will be honest. I bet I don't know how to spell Wahhabism. H H A B I. Two Bs or not two Bs probably doesn't matter if you learn how to say it. We have, a, we have a couple very good books on Islam if, if you want to take advantage of them. This is one of them. And the same author of this book uh, writes a couple other books. Very good book. All right. Uh, somebody said double B. It was not to be. Um... So what we're saying, brothers and sisters, what we're saying is, is that in the Millerite history, and I will bring this to a close and take a break, when, when the mighty angel came down in the Millerite history, it's when the four great powers of Europe put a restraint on Islam who were causing a distress of nations. Okay? And we're saying the number four represents worldwide, and this history is pointing forward to a time in Earth's history when once again the whole world, not just four powers, the whole world, it's the number four represents worldwide, is going to come together to put a restraint on Islam because they're angering the nations. And we're saying that on September 11, 2001, immediately thereafter, the most powerful nation in the world went out and put a restraint on Islam. And yesterday, in Obama's speech, he reiterated that he's still in agreement with that philosophy of George Bush, and the restraint is going to be contained on Islam through his administration also. And we're saying that, that the, the, the issue here isn't Islam. 
so much as it is that Islam is restrained. It was restrained here. It was restrained here. Um, we've kind of touched on some of these things. Turn to page 46. I've referred to you on page 46. It says directed by the hand of the Lord. We've read concerning the 1843 chart being directed by the hand of the Lord. But underneath that you see the quote that I have referenced to the 1850 chart for manuscript releases volume 13 page 359 that says I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by brother Nichols. I saw that there was a prophecy of the this chart in the Bible and if this chart is designed for God's people if it's sufficient for one it is for another and if one needed a new chart painted on a larger scale all need it just as much she's putting the same inspired endorsement on that chart is as on that chart and on both those charts Islam of the first and second woe is represented as those war horses underneath that it says the four wind restrained and brothers and sisters that's what we're saying I'm saying that if you read Revelation 9 verses 14 and 15 which is the 391 year and 15 day time prophecy at the what when that time prophecy begins there are four angels that are loosed now if I tell my children you go out and you go swimming for one hour then they go swimming for one hour and at the end of that hour what do they do they quit swimming if they're obedient okay so if, if these four angels, which Pioneer cor understanding correctly is, is that they represent these Islamic sultans, this is Islam, if they're loosed back here in 1449, and they're loosed for 391 years, when the time is up, what happens to them? They're unloosed, okay? They're restrained. So at the prophetic level, they're loosed at the beginning and therefore they're restrained. So we're seeing that these powers, which is Islam, are restrained. But then in history, we find that the historical event that marks the end of this time prophecy is also identifying an actual restraining of Islam. When the four great powers intercede and tell Egypt, you back off or we're going to deal with you. All right, that's what went on. So restraint is what's being emphasized here. And we're saying, of course, that there was this restraint of Islam placed here. And on page 46, it says, the four winds restrained. And we've already dealt with the quote where Sister White says, the angels are holding the four winds, represented as an angry horse, seeking to break forth and bring death and destruction. And we're identifying in that passage. Go back to the previous page. Let's make sure we remind ourselves. Uh, on page 45, under the four winds restrained, it says, angels are holding the four winds represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose. This angry horse is what? It's restrained. The four winds are restrained. This angry horse is restrained. He's seeking to break loose. Okay, so the prophetic emphasis it's about Islam, but it's not so much about Islam. It's about when Islam has a restraint placed on it. Do you see that? Okay. So we're saying that because it was Islam that brought the distress of nations, that in Revelation 11 verse 18, it's Islam that brings the angering of the nations because distress and angering are synonymous words. So in page 46 under the four winds restrained, it says this. This view was given in 1847 with the, when there were but very few of the Advent brethren observing Sabbath and of these but few supposed that its observance was of sufficient importance to draw a line between the people of God and unbelievers. Now the fulfillment of that view is beginning to be seen. The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out. This is the little time of trouble that you asked about earlier. She's making a distinction between uh, the time of trouble that where probation is still open and she's comparing it with the time of trouble of the seven last plagues when probation is closed. She says, the commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they're poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. Okay, so Christ is still 
ministering in the sanctuary, at that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check. They're going to be restrained. So as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time. At what time? At the time when the restraint is placed upon them. At that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come. And what we're saying is, brothers and sisters, is the restraint was placed upon Islam immediately after September 11th, 2001. And on September 11th, 2001, the great buildings of New York City were thrown down. Then Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 was fulfilled. And when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 descends, it's common, correct, Adventist understanding to identify that that's when the latter rain begins to sprinkle and that's what Sister White is here saying. When the angering of the nations begins, but at the same time is restrained, the latter rain begins to fall. The mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. And at the same time, the four winds of Revelation 7 are restrained so that the 144,000 could begin the sealing process. On September 11th, 2001, the latter rain began to sprinkle and the sealing of the 144,000 began. Shall we pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that we that we've made it this far through this Sabbath day. But we thank you that we've been allowed to consider these and handle these truths that are unfolding at this time in Earth's history. We understand that this is the point in history that every one of the prophets desired to live within. And here we are as Laodiceans standing here at the end of the world and you've given us opportunity to participate in this holy experience and this holy work that everyone that participated in producing the Bible desired to be involved with. We do not deserve in any way to understand these things or to be among those that enter into this experience and proclaim this message, but we do understand that you have the power available to allow us to be among that number if we would just strive to be them. And we ask that you would give us the wisdom and discernment to understand what is necessary in each of our individual experiences to put us into position where you can make us powerful tools in your service that we might take this final morning message not just to Adventism but to the world Amen. and finish the work and go home be with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So now we're going to take some questions. The question is, is why are the sons of Ishmael referred to as princes and not sons? Uh, you know, I don't know that for certain. I guess it's maybe I, I trying to put an emphasis that Ishmael so, can be understood as a king, but I don't know. But what does that mean? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know of any of, you know, profound revelation connected with why the word prince is employed there other than just the basic m marking them as leaders 
Hey, we have a question back here. Excuse me. Sir, sir, it's sir. I have a, a question about uh, Islam being uh, restrained as a religion because uh, uh, on 9 11. Because studies show that uh, since 9 11, they've been growing even faster. And the restraint seemed to be on, on extremist Islam, not as on uh, Islam as a religion. What you have to say? Well, but th there's a lot about, about these things that, that I don't understand fully, and you know, I don't have an answer for. But for me, I, maybe I'm missing something here. It, it's not so much. It, it's it's the action of Islam being restrained at that point in time that is marking when the angel comes down. It's a marker of when the angel descends, and th th that's basically what it is. It's it's not it's not providing any long term implications about the restraint of Islam or what that means. It's it's the it's one of the arguments that allows us to demonstrate that this history is being repeated. When Islam is restrained the angel descends. When the angel descends, the, the sealing of the 144,000 begins. When the sealing of the 144,000 begins, the, the sprinkling of the latter rain begins. It, it's a, a marker. It's a prophetic way mark. So I, don't, I assume that you're correct, and I'm not threatened by that you're correct, that Islam is, is growing stronger and stronger I religiously and that the restraint is primarily on radical Islam. I don't deny that. I'm just saying that the restraint that was placed on them, it, it fits the parallel, and we're beyond that way mark. Yeah, they're seeking to break loose and bring more death and destruction in their path. We have a question here. Well, that's all I was going to say, is that it says that the, in the quote in Selected Messages, it says the angels... On page 45, it says the angels are holding the four winds re represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose, not the religion. It's not holding back the religion. It's holding back the destruction. Okay. If that answers your question. Hold on just a second. I'll be right there. <laughs> Brother Jeff, thank you for your presentation. Um, I would say that I, I wouldn't have a problem with your presentation. I think it's accurate. Um, I agree with you that there were times that Islam was protecting uh, true Christians. That, that's true. And you, and you demonstrated that through history. I do have a few questions that I'd like to ask you. In your knowledge, what do the pioneers say about the third woe? And how do they apply it to Islam? I can answer too. Do you, you have an answer you want to give for that? Uh, 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 that's to have an overview of yeah of but the, the one of the things that the pioneers say and James White was one of them and and one other was in, has also taught this whether it was Andrews or Loughborough and I I only remember I don't remember their names but I remember what they said because I believe they were wrong they were they they placed the the seventh trumpet as a symbol of the seven last plagues. That the seventh trumpet is the judgment that's accomplished upon mo modern Rome uh, that, is, that is tied up in the seven last plagues. And, and I'm not too threatened completely by that, but the, the seven trumpets are uh, a prefiguring the seven last plagues. Okay, because trumpets represent the, the judgments upon Rome. And the judgments that are uh, upon Rome in the 
seven trumpets are prefiguring the judgments upon modern Rome and the seven last plagues. Therefore, I, I've come to the conviction prophetically that even though there are close parallels, and when you line up the seven trumpets with the seven plagues, they're almost identical in expressions. <coughs> But the difference is, is that the seven trumpets are judgments on Rome that take place before probation closes and the seven plagues take place after judgment closes. So when, when some of the pioneers take the seventh trumpet it, to use as a, uh, an illustration of all the seven last plagues, I have a problem going there. But my question again is, what do the pioneers say about the third woe concerning Islam? Well, the, 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 only, the only thing that I know that they say about it is what he's saying is that it, you're saying that was Andrews that said that. I could be wrong. They were scared to death when the restraint was taken off the table. Yeah, they overflow the whole world. So you feel they were scared to death? They seen them as a they seen them as okay. a sinister power. Yeah. So how do you see their understanding in that statement? When when we get to applying end time Bible prophecy, uh, th there are several points where I find discrepancies in okay. the pioneers. I don't I don't have confidence in in how the pioneers walk okay. through Revelation 17. Okay. Um, I I s generally find that their basic their basic understanding of the the churches the seals and the trumpets is sound and it's something that you can build on but when you get down to the seventh church the seventh seal and the seventh okay. trumpet which is it was in the future for them they have some weaknesses so if if i remember well you mentioned uh, please correct me if i understood it wrong you mentioned that on september 11 the sealing of the 144,000 began yep you mentioned that yep prophetically okay the trouble I have with that, first of all, is that uh, there's no, that's, that's a conclusion you have arrived. Uh, the pioneers don't mention that. Um, the spirit of prophecy doesn't mention that. Sort of. Sort of. Uh, the if you if you look at the horses, if you look at the horses and you say the angry horses are Islam, it's very important that you say not the Ellen White said that. So what I'm saying is the spirit of prophecy does not say that. So the, tr the first trouble I have with that is that I, I don't have any trouble respecting someone's opinion. But when a teacher as you, Brother Jeff, declares something as final, for me, it's very important, it would be very important, that you'd say something like, in my personal journey, in my personal conviction, I have come to that conclusion. I, I think it's at least prudent, a studious person as you, Brother Jeff, to say that, because uh, it, 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 it. Calm down, brother. Yeah. No, calm down. Calm uh, down, I'm brother. Not, I'm not threatened by this. This, yeah. is, this is friendly fire, yeah. all right? It's no friendly fire. <laughs> you don't need to defend your teacher. No, <laughs> yes. Just calm down a little bit. So, the first point I have, and I thank you for the. Well, don't, don't, don't line out too many points because I do want to respond to you. Okay. Make some and then. Uh, so, brother Jeff, I. I Thank you for the comment on the friendly fire because I, I agree with you and I'm not threatened by, by your statements. But as a friend and brother, uh, I'm suggesting that would, it would be better if you would make the observation that it, it, it is your personal conviction because... What? No, 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 wait better a minute, for wait. him. He, he's a, no, wait, don't, don't worry. Don't get... <laughs> Don't be threatened by that. Uh, wait, threatened does someone have a great that. controversy? I do. Okay, yeah. I hear two of your points. Two? Uh, the other... Uh, okay. Well, the other two points that I'd like to mention is that Wahhabism is not a religion. It's a sect of Islam. And the other thing I, I'd like to mention is that as there are extremists in Wahhabism, that are promoting these things, 
there are people in Wahhabism from the government that are defending against terrorism. They're having the same problems as the U.S. trying to defend against, against terrorism as the U.S. is trying to defend against terrorism. So just a little point there. The other uh, brief point is that Mark Gabriel, if I'm not mistaken, was a Muslim. And he wrote this book, he became a Christian, he had to change his name, if I'm not mistaken. And I would say that, w we can read this book, but I would say if we want to be more fair, Brother Jeff, there are good books written by Muslims about Islam. We should also recommend some of these books, because if we want someone to learn about Adventism, we would prefer to read someone who would r write from the Adventist perspective. We would prefer not to read someone who was an Adventist and became a Muslim or became something else. So it's at least fair that we, there are good books uh, from the Islamic perspective that, that we can recommend. There are fair books. So just in, in a matter of fairness to recommend also other books and there are some that can be recommended by Muslim writers. These are two points so far. Three. No, two points after the first one that I mentioned. <laughs> okay. You said two more. I mentioned well, I, two uh, I, I, I'm, I'm tell me in one-liners what those points are so I'm sure. What? what are your points? Real quick, again, review them for me so I know I'm understanding the same points you okay, are. Okay, th th these two points are separate from the first one. Okay, well let me re respond to the points I'm understanding so far, so I don't lose you. The, number one, uh, uh, I don't know how, it, it, I, I stand corrected on Wahhabism being a, select, a sect and not a religion. I, I don't understand in any way whatsoever why that would change anything that I said, so, but I stand corrected on the distinction there. Um, I don't know how fair it is to have to recommend books on Islam that are written by people that are on Islam and using Adventism as a, the, the point of reference to define that as fairness because I understand that, that Adventism is God's church on earth and Islam is not. Okay, so I don't, I don't, I understand your, your context that because this is God's church uh, that it should be represented um, from God's perspective, from someone within God's church, but I don't hold Islam in that same type of reference so I don't know that the fairness is there. But when you say that n that for me to be teaching what I'm teaching, that it's you know like a private interpretation if we want to pull the, the thing out, out of the Bible, if this were true, and if it hasn't been specifically identified either in the Bible or, or the Spirit of Prophecy, and by specifically identified, what I mean is there's no verse in the Bible or there's no passage in the Spirit of Prophecy that says these words, on September 11th, the two tall buildings in the United States are going to be brought down in New York City and that's when the angel of Revelation 18 descends. If there's nothing that specific in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, but if it's true and the Lord wants it to become known to his people, then he's forced to use human beings to understand this and teach this. And if this is true, then which human being in the Adventist church would you prefer that would teach us? Because I'd prefer the, that everyone in this room taught it, but I don't, I don't know the argument about it shouldn't be me teaching it, how relevant that is. It isn't relevant about who's teaching it or who isn't it teaching it. It's relevant about whether it's true or not. Now you say that Sister White does not say that. I say that the Bible and the spirit of prophecy teaches things, says things specifically by bringing line upon line together, here a little, there a little, and th that those specifications are absolutely crystal clear. I want to read you one from Great Controversy 611. It says, The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message, that's this angel, Revelation 18, joining this message, angel, the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. Worldwide extent, unwanted power takes place here. Then she says, a, a, a work of worldwide extent and one wanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 
was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world, and in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has ever been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. The work will be similar to that as the day of Pentecost, and it's very easy to draw the reform line of Pentecost underneath this and nail down the identical specifics. So, so when, when you're saying that Ellen White does not say this, what I'm saying is that Ellen White is crystal clear that this history from 1840 to 1840 is a history that's already been illustrated with the history of Pentecost and that those two witnesses, the history of Pentecost and the history of the Millerites from 1840 to 1844 are illustrating the history of the latter reign when the mighty angel comes down out of heaven. To me, that isn't me teaching that. That's the spirit of prophecy. There, is, there isn't any of these characteristics that I've placed on these timelines that haven't been selected from the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. I may have been involved with placing them on the bo board and, and identifying them, but that's the voice of the Lord. That's not my voice. Now, parable of the ten virgins, the repetition of Revelation 14, the seven thunders, the reform lines. Now, I, I know what I've taught public for, publicly for the last 15 years and more than anyone in this room I know that over the past 15 years this is, I, I, don't, I can't count them but there's 15 or 20 things that I taught incorrectly. Okay, I, I didn't understand it. I was out there. I was teaching it incorrectly. At some point in time I realized it was incorrect. And I, oh man, what a bummer. And I go back and I either straighten it up or, or I d d don't bring it up anymore because it's such a minor thing. I have never, ever stood in front of God's people and say, hey, I'm flawless. I tell the people, you better test these things by the word of God. I also tell them, I'm not a pastor. I'm a plaster. I'm a I'm a plastering contractor, okay? I haven't been trained in public speaking. So there's mistakes that I make in my speech. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I know how to de defend this, this message a little bit because I've heard it attacked before, and I'm not saying you, Bar, I mean attacked, seriously. The question isn't, to me, the question isn't whether I'm putting the wrong emphasis and it seems like the one place that bothers you the most, and that's okay on the angry horse of Islam. The question is, is does the, the abundance September of the 11 also bothers me. So it's not only okay. the angry horse. Bro. Okay, yeah. so September 11th, the angry horse, there's some things that, that are problematic for, problematic for you, but what amazes me when people have these things that are problematic, how they can look at all the ab other abundant testimony that falls in place with this and find either the the emphasis that's being placed on things by the messenger or the style of the messenger or some preconceived opinion they have about a certain aspect of prophecy to take the baby and throw it right out with the bathwater and I'm not suggesting that you're doing that but if this is true who do you expect is going to present it? My point is the following let's suppose that this is true okay okay if this is true all is fine my point is a question of prudence. You are saying, you are stating in a final way that on September 11, the 144,000 began the process of being sealed. You are stating that. My suggestion to you, and it's in a brotherly way that I'm doing this, even if 